Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Sure. Um, we heard a talk from uh, Daimler before on innovation. What is the main difference between Germany and uh, United States and Valley when it comes to startups? Well, you make better cars, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I. I don't think there's much difference. I go all over the world meeting with um, entrepreneurs. and uh, For example, Lab 1886 has offices all over the world. And I would say that entrepreneurs all over the world are more similar than they are different. And I think a lot of it is uh, an optimism that the glass is half full, an optimism that, in the words of Steve Jobs, you can dent the universe. Uh, Maybe failure is a little less negative in Silicon Valley, but you know there's nowhere that failure is okay, uh, contrary to what you might hear about. You know, it's no big deal to fail. It is a big deal to fail. So I, I don't think there's that much difference, really. Um, I think America is also blowing it a little bit with. Uh, Uh, entrepreneurship and startups now because of our immigration policies so we may be making it better for the rest of the world um, for entrepreneurs so what else question here you have definitely a smarter political leader than we do that's for sure <laughs> so. <laughs> Hi, Guy. Nice to meet you. So I was wondering, in your books, you're an author as well, so I was wondering that sometimes it shines through like when you write or in the tiles as well, as well that, there is like, that there might be a connection to art. So my question is, what does art mean to you personally, if that's okay to ask? Oh, what does art yes. mean to me? What is art for you? Huh. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an artist. No. No. But, but one of your books is I called, for example, con artist, The Art of the Start, for example. So yes. there's, there's oh, maybe okay, a simplicity okay. or... So, yeah, so like um, many of my books, The Art of Enchantment, The Art of the Start, The Art of Social Media, uh, is my belief that those skills are arts. They are not sciences. And I don't think any of those, entrepreneurship, social media, enchantment, is you know a cut-and-dried science with... Um, proof or disproof of the null hypothesis at all. Uh, I, I think that a lot of uh, the success of in any of those fields is luck and it's passion, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, if it were a science, we would be more successful than we are. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the usual wisdom about the success of entrepreneurship is you know, one or two out of a hundred, right? And, There's no scientist in the world. You could say, well, if you're right one or two times out of a hundred, you're a good scientist. Uh, that is, so you have to be an artist, I guess. Uh, I'm sorry. Playfulness. Would Playfulness. You, would that be, would that be a, a difference, differentiator, or what is the differentiation between? I mean, obviously, you can measure everything, but like I don't know if you can measure Intuition, maybe, everything. or what would what, what is the secret ingredient, maybe, or. I don't know. Again, trying to pinpoint something that's difficult to describe. Yes, words. well, I think in, in tech entrepreneurship anyway, uh, the richest vein for successful tech startups is that the founders of the company are creating something that they want to use. So it's not because of marketing. It's not because they talk to customers. It's not any you know quote-unquote scientific method. It's just... Two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in a garage. They created the product that they wanted to use. And lo and behold, they weren't the only two people in the world who wanted to use it. And I, I think that describes most great tech startups. What else? Here. Yes. Hey, Guy. Um, the art of the innovation. Uh, nowadays, when you think about this in your book, uh, it, it, we think about entrepreneurship. When do, we t when do we take the shift to the art of purposeful innovation? When do we start with other NGOs and big organizations, for example, um, fight global, uh, global warming with the techniques you are using or you are teaching uh, to entrepreneurs? Well, I hope that they are already doing that. Um, you know, my book wasn't written just to create unicorns. So um, I think that the methods in my book apply to almost any startup. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, I think 
entrepreneurs and startups are more similar than they are different all over the world. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't see why they can't use it now. I mean, you know, a startup, you have to think of uh, an NGO, for example, has to raise money, has to hire, has to ship something. Um, I, I don't, the, the revenue model may be different, but even in the revenue model, they are selling something, right? It may not be dollars exchange, but it's at least uh, a belief. So I, I think they're more similar than they are different. Do we have more warm-up questions one here? Question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Guy. Uh, I would like to ask you, like uh, a colleague asked what is different between Silicon Valley and here, yeah. but we know that there are a lot of innovations when they are done in other parts of the world, they don't heat as uh, it was in the Silicon Valley. What do you think is the secret behind uh, what makes it like a more successful and international wide in Silicon Valley than in other parts of the world? Um, well, first, I think we might have to do a very careful st statistical analysis to see if we are, in fact, um, more successful. Uh, it could be that on a percentage basis, we are not any more successful. It's just that there are more startups in Silicon Valley. So it's the law of big numbers. If you have infinite monkeys pounding on keyboards in Silicon Valley, you're bound to have, you know. Um, so I, I think that, first of all, we have to visit the assumption that we are more successful. Uh, I, I would also say that in Silicon Valley, we are better at declaring victory than most parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the flip side of declaring victory is uh, we are very skilled at faking it until we make it. And that is a talent in Silicon Valley. Um, you could say that the extreme case of that is Terranos. I mean, talk about faking it. Well, they didn't make it, but they, <laughs> they sure faked it well. So, uh, so those are some of the skills that we possess. It's not clear to me that you should uh, emulate us. Um, I think in Silicon Valley, we're just very good at, well, we throw a lot of things up against the wall. Uh, some of them succeed. And then we go up to the wall and we paint the bullseye around what's stuck. And we say, we hit the bullseye. Um, you can always hit the bullseye if you paint the bullseye after. <laughs> you throw something against the wall. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Oh. Uh, one question here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw your YouTube uh, like 13 years ago, <laughs> the first time. Yeah. I don't think there was YouTube 30 years ago. 13, 13, <laughs> not oh, 13. Oh, 13, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what do you think, what's the main change from then to now for you? Um, I think that entrepreneurship is, is, uh, has less barriers to entry because much of what you need to start a tech company anyway is fast, free, and ubiquitous. Um, you know, that nobody goes and buys a $1 million software license to write software anymore. Uh, very few companies go out and buy rooms full of servers and maintain their own servers. Everything is... Amazon Web Services or Microsoft or Google or, you know, somebody besides your own location. Uh, I think that teams are much more virtual. Therefore, there's probably less commercial real estate necessary. I think that social media, um, for all of its bad, is overall tremendously good. So social media is fast and free and ubiquitous, so it's easier to market things. So if you look at all the things, you know, real estate, tools, hardware, um, marketing, and people, I think they're all cheaper or free. And so that means that more people can start companies. Um, this doesn't mean that more companies will be successful, but uh, I, would I would rather have more people starting companies than fewer people starting companies because I, I am a believer in the law of big numbers, which is... The more monkeys on keyboards, the more likely <laughs> you are to get gay products. We have another question over yeah. here. Yeah. 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 
Um, yeah, uh, we were talking uh, talking a, l a lot these days about digital transformation and agility and stuff. So also things that will bring innovation into operations. Yes. So I, I would I would like to to double check if uh, again back in the past you gave out a, a, a paradigm for kind of leadership that was very simple and at least stuck with me and I live by it. It's the map paradigm, mastery, autonomy, purpose. Yes. Do you think this is still the key to yes. leadership? Or is, has there something changed in the past okay. 10 years with agility, scrum, all these new methods? So, um, in the book Enchantment, I wrote about Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink has a book called Drive. And in that book called Drive, he discusses wh what enables people or companies to have really believers as employees. And he says that in addition to adequate compensation, you should provide a map. And this map, MAP, is mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And so what you're saying to employees is that if you come to work for us, you will master new skills. We'll make you a better employee. You'll be working autonomously, independently, and you'll be working towards a higher purpose rather than simply you know, making money. Uh, I think those are all still the same. And uh, I think the companies that offer employees the ability to you know, achieve this map um, are the ones that ultimately will win the war for talent because um, we have gone beyond simply trying to survive financially. And you have to provide other things. Last question. I like these questions before. No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> just leave at 4.15. And like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my question is, um, firstly, we're, I'm part of an Iraqi startup de delegation. An so Iraqi John? startup? Yeah, really? yeah. We're th there's a few of us around here in the room. Yeah? <laughs> yeah there we go. So I think the, our biggest question here, what we're trying to find out here is uh, in places where there's low tech adoption of the digital world and the mm. entrepreneurship in the digital world is quite new, um, where does this conversation fit in? Or will we find out during this talk? In this conversation? This what you're about to see? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, again, you know, for the third does it time. Apply? Does it apply? I, I, everything applies. Um, I, I think that you are probably, you know, more similar to two people from Stanford University inside Silicon Valley than you would believe. Um, I, and again, I think it's an optimism. It is a belief that the world uh, can be a better place. Uh, it is also, I hope you're building a tool that you want to use as opposed to a tool that, you know, you read is necessary because of some mega trend bullshit. Um, These guys will surprise you. They're yeah? Here. yeah, we've got some really, um, a variety of startups really tackling real life issues yeah? over there. But it's more of the cultural change that we're, we're so the art of innovation, in particular through culture change, to make the audience or the customers or the, whoever it is that's interacting with our startups, be able to, to accept this new technology, tech-based solution? I hope so. If not, move. <laughs> Is it 4.15? I think we have time for, for one yeah, last question. Know. Okay, I'll keep answering. I don't care. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. <laughs> Please buy an electric car from us. <laughs> so we ready? Yeah, we are. Okay, so, so now you get the, the presentation part. So... Oh. Inform you oh, that okay. we, we have a TV outside next to the truck um, where you can also watch Guy because we have we don't have space here anymore. So the table is too big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you you know Guy, you know the topic, and there's nothing left to say. So. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll give you a little bit more introduction. Uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki. I live in Silicon Valley, California. Uh, I am two things right now. I'm a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador. There are about 10 uh, international brand ambassadors for Mercedes, and there's another 40 or 50 around the world. Each country has their own. I'm one of the 10. Uh, there are people like uh, Roger Federer, uh, tennis, big wave surfer, um, <sighs> Mac, Mac, Garrett McNamara, oh my God, Garrett McNamara, uh, Susan Wolf, a Formula One driver. So those are the corporate ones, and then there's each country. So I'm one of those. Um, in other words, I'm one of the few people in the world who gets paid to drive a Mercedes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. That's how you and I are different. Um, 
<laughs> Unless you're a Formula One driver. Uh, and I'm also the chief evangelist of a company called Canva. Uh, how many of you use Canva or heard of Canva? Oh, very good. So Canva is an online design service. Uh, basically, think of it as Photoshop for the rest of us. And um, what I will promise you is that in the time that uh, you could boot Photoshop, you could finish a design in Canva. That's basically how you should look at it, okay? Uh, so that's what I am. Uh, I worked at Apple twice. I was first software evangelist in the Macintosh division. In fact, this is a picture of the Macintosh division around 1984. And uh, I also worked at Apple as Apple's chief evangelist. I returned to Apple in 1995. Uh, in this picture, uh, I'm right there. You can <laughs> barely see me. I, you know, I should have stood in the front of this picture. Uh, but I, like, who the hell knew that Apple would be a trillion dollar company? Um, in fact, I left Apple twice and I turned Steve down for a third job. So. Uh, Maybe you shouldn't listen to me because obviously I'm not that smart. Uh, of course, if I had not done that, I wouldn't be a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador and then I wouldn't be here. So uh, that maybe it all worked out. Uh, of course, the most important person in this picture is Steve Jobs. Uh, he's there kneeling in the front. Uh, this is a historical photo because this is the only known instance of Steve Jobs ever getting on his knees for anybody, for anything. Um, uh, Everybody wants a story. It'd be funny if the Mac didn't work right now. Uh, <laughs> everybody wants a story about Steve Jobs when they find out that I worked at Apple. So I'll give you my best Steve Jobs story. So one day I'm in my cubicle and I'm working and he shows up with someone I had never met in my life. And he says to me, Guy, what do you think of this company called Nowhere, K-N-O-W-A-R-E? It was an educational software company. Well, Steve, it's kind of a mediocre company, mediocre product, drill and practice, arithmetic, 2 plus 2 equals 4, doesn't really use graphics, doesn't use multimedia, doesn't use WYSIWYG, doesn't use much at all, mediocre, not strategic for us. And he says to me, I want you to meet the CEO of Nowhere. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, that would be like... Dieter bringing somebody and saying, oh, so what do you think of this? <laughs> and then you just say it, and it's, oh, yeah, Dieter, thank you very much. It's the CEO. Uh, so th this was the largest group of egomaniacs in the history of California. Uh, because we worked for Steve, we thought we were very special. Um, we would not let Apple II division employees into this building. And if you can imagine working for a company where... Uh, even though you work for the same company, you were not allowed into the building. So Apple II division employees were not allowed into that building. And of course, they quickly figured out that they were not being allowed into the building they paid for because Apple II was selling and Macintosh was not yet shipping. Uh, so they came up with a great joke about us, which is how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around it. Yeah. <laughs> The Microsoft version of this joke is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer to that is none, because Bill Gates has declared darkness the new standard. <laughs> so this is my past uh, in the Macintosh division, OK? Uh, so let's talk about the art of innovation, as I learned. Uh, I have been at Apple, obviously. I've started several software companies. I have been a venture capitalist, so I've invested in software companies. And as you heard, I'm now currently at uh, Canva, which is Australia's second unicorn, the first unicorn being Atlassian. So uh, I think that when all is said and done, uh, truly the companies that are successful are the ones that have made meaning. That is, they have changed the world. They have dented the universe. They have somehow made the world better. And it, to me, the way it works is you make the world better and the market rewards you. So if you truly want to be successful, you have to ha decide how to make meaning. And I have some examples of companies and the meaning that they make. So Apple has democratized computing. Google has made information available to everyone. And Canva, the company I currently work for, is trying to democratize design so that every one of you can make beautiful designs. So th if we succeed, Canva, then we will probably be very well rewarded. Google is very well rewarded. Apple's very well rewarded. So if you look at these companies, I hope you see that, well, 
You know, they, they really have made people's lives better and they have enriched themselves. But which came first? I think it's making people's lives better. The second thing that I learned is that great innovation occurs when you don't stay on the same curve in your industry, but you get to the next curve. And so I like to use ice. Uh, there used to be an ice harvesting industry in the United States. This is 1900, where people would go out to a frozen lake or a frozen pond, cut blocks of ice, sell it to customers. Uh, this was a significant improvement for many people's lives because now they didn't have to go and cut their own ice. They could have the cleanliness and convenience of ice. 30 years go by, there's now the ice factory. This is better than the harvester because now you can freeze water any city, any time of year. It doesn't have to be winter. It doesn't have to be a cold place. Another 30 years go by, and now we have the refrigerator curve. And this is even better because now... You don't have to depend on the ice man delivering ice to your house. You had your own personal ice factory, a PC, if you will, a personal chiller. Now, the very interesting historical fact is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories and none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies because most companies are stupid and they define themselves in terms of what they already do. So if you define yourself as we harvest ice in the winter by cutting blocks of ice from frozen lakes and ponds, you don't embrace the factory. If you build a factory and you freeze water centrally, you don't embrace the refrigerator. And this is the most scary slide of all in my presentation. This is a picture of an engineer at Kodak, 1975. Guess what he invented? That thing on the table, digital cameras. In 1975, Kodak invented digital cameras. Wrap your head around that, right? So can you imagine him going to his boss and saying, I have created a way where people do not have to buy film anymore. Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly, Kodak did not embrace digital photography. And now, absolutely none of you use a Kodak camera because Kodak misdefined their business. So Kodak should have figured out that they're in the business of preserving memories as opposed to chemicals on film. And if they had figured out that they're in the preservation of memories business, they would still be successful. This is what I call the slide of death. So Kodak defined their business as chemicals. Polaroid, chemicals on paper. Wang, dedicated word processor. Smith Corona, typewriter. Right? So Kodak and Polaroid should have figured out that they're in the memory preservation business. Then they would have embraced digital cameras, VR, AR, whatever it was. Wang, a dedicated word processor, Smith Corona, a typewriter, both in the communication business, not in the typewriter business, not in the word processing business. So the lesson I want to hammer in is that you've got to get to the next curve. When, when Apple was finishing Macintosh, nobody asked Apple for a Macintosh. Nobody said to Apple, well, give us a cute little graphics toy with a monochrome nine-inch display that was WYSIWYG with a trash can in the right-hand corner with a mouse. Everybody was saying, give us a bigger, faster, cheaper Apple II. And so when you ask your existing customers what they want, they usually tell you, what they want in terms of what they're already getting. So if they're getting an Apple II, guess what? They're going to ask for an Apple II that's bigger, faster, and cheaper. If they're buying a Macintosh, they're going to ask for a bigger, faster, cheaper Macintosh, not an iOS device. And so it goes. So if Kodak were to have asked its customers, what do you want from us? They would say deeper color, richer color, faster film, faster ASAs. Nobody would have said, well, we want you to eliminate film. We want you to have a digital camera. Nobody would have ever said that. Number three. Number three is stolen from a song by Bobby McFerrin, Don't Worry, Be Happy. What I think you need to do is don't worry, be crappy. And by this, I mean when you are on the next curve, it's okay to have elements of crappiness to your product. Right? So the first Macintosh, 128K, 400K floppy drive, slow network, monochrome, small screen. Thanks to my efforts, there was no software. It was a piece of crap, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap. <laughs> so I'm not telling you to ship crap. I'm telling you to ship something that's on the next curve, and it can have elements of crappiness to it. The first refrigerator was hardly the great refrigerators we have today. 
It was also a piece of crap. The first laser printer, $7,000, single-sided, 8.5 by 11 only. You know, it was a piece of crap, but it was so much better than the best dot matrix printer. It was okay to ship. Number four. Number four is my lesson from Steve Jobs, which very few people understand, is that he truly did focus on merit. So this is a picture of a reunion of the people who work for Steve Jobs. So this is the moderator, Katie Hafner from the New York Times. This is Joanna Hoffman. Uh, she ran marketing for the Macintosh division in the movie Steve Jobs. Kate Winslet played Joanna Hoffman. Debbie Coleman ran the factory. Susan Barnes was finance. Barbara Koken was product marketing. And Annie Cunningham was the outside account executives, executive who ran uh, the PR firm that worked with Apple. And so I'm trying to point out to you that back in the mid-'80s, Steve Jobs had this many direct reports who were female. I can tell you with total certainty, Steve Jobs did not care about your race, color, creed, sexual orientation, or religion. He just cared about one thing, your competence. You were either great or shit. That was it. It didn't matter what race, color, creed, gender, or sexual orientation you had. Steve Jobs was way ahead of his time. And this woman once went with Steve to Japan towards the end of the Macintosh project uh, to negotiate with Sony to put Sony disk drives into the Macintosh. Sony pulled Steve aside and said, we will not negotiate with a woman. Steve told Sony, if you will not negotiate with Susan Barnes, you will not have our business. And the rest is history. There was a Sony drive <laughs> inside Macintosh. So the lesson that I learned is focus on merit. In my humble opinion, it is so hard to find great people why would you limit your pool by having some predisposed position towards gender, race, religion, color, sexual orientation? It's so hard to find good people, man. You cannot use those stupid, irrelevant kind of characteristics to eliminate them. Number five. Number five is do not be afraid of polarizing people. This is a picture of a TiVo. Uh, Back then, it was the only way to time shift TV programs, right? So people like me love TiVo because we travel so much. But there are lots of people who hated TiVo, principally large brands and their agencies, because large brands and their agencies spent millions of dollars making advertising. And then people like me with TiVo skip through all the ads. I never watch TV commercials to this day. Well, except for one day a year, which is the day that you watch the commercials, not necessarily the game, Super Bowl Sunday. Because <laughs> I don't know about you in Europe, but man, we are sick of seeing Tom Brady. So anyway, <laughs> so this is an example that, you know, some people love TiVo, some people hated TiVo. It's okay. Some people love Macintosh, some people hate Macintosh. Also okay. The worst case is you're not on the radar. People don't even know you exist. That's what you have to prevent. Number six. Number six is you're going to have to learn to ignore people who say it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. These are naysayers, these are clowns, idiots, bozos. I think that bozos, there's two kinds of bozos in the world. One is slovingly disgusting body odor pocket protector. You look at this person and you say, you are a loser. That person is not dangerous because only losers listen to losers. So if you're not a loser, dangerous bozo, won't affect you because you will just ignore the dangerous bozo. Only a loser listens to losers. Remember that. Now, the other kind of bozo is the winner bozo. The winner bozo is perceived as rich and powerful and famous. And because they are rich and powerful and famous, many people conclude they must also be smart. But I'm telling you, that is a dangerous assumption because if you look at it, by that logic, there are many people who are actors and actresses. You would say, huh, they must be smart. They'll, they can advise me on how to raise children, how to get your kids into college, um, how to pick your religion, your spirituality. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that you should not listen to rich and famous people. So I think I need to inoculate you to bolsosity. I think bolsosity is just like the flu. So you need to take shots. You need to get vaccinated. And so I'm going to give you some vaccination for bozosity. 
I think there's a world, a world market for maybe five computers. The chairman of IBM said this in 1943. So I have five Macintoshes in my house. I have all the computers he anticipated in the world, in my house. This is 20% right here. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. So Western Union wrote off telephones in 1876, right? Maybe the strategic direction for Western Union in 1876 was let's teach Americans the Morse code. How hard could that be? Then we can have a telegraph in every house. And as Americans get more mobile on their carts during the winter when they're cutting ice, <laughs> we'll have a large bale of copper wire that will just spool out behind the cart. That will be our mobile telephony solution. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, founder of DEC. Ken Olson was a great entrepreneur, very innovative. He took us from the mainframe business to the mini computer business. And yet he could not embrace personal computers. It is as if he was a successful ice factory owner and he resisted, guess what, refrigerators. Could you blame him, though? If you were so successful making mini computers, would you embrace personal computers? I'd like to think we all would, but history has shown that people do not do that. So what I'm trying to communicate to you is not that you know, everybody's wrong if they tell you you won't succeed. I wish it were true that when people tell you you'll fail, it means you will succeed. That is not true. It's not that easy. But if people tell you you'll fail and you don't even try, you will never know. And that is the worst outcome of all. Number seven. Number seven is my observation that changing your mind is a sign of courage and intelligence. Our innovative approach using Web 2.0 based standards lets developers create amazing new applications while keeping the iPhone secure and reliable. Steve said this June 11, 2007, the announcement of iPhone. Let me translate what he's saying. He's saying the iPhone is a closed system. The only way you can add functionality to the iPhone is Safari plugins. A year goes by. Apple executives to showcase Mac OS X Leopard and OS X iPhone development platforms at the Worldwide Developer Conference 2008 keynote. Let me translate this for you. Ma not Macintosh. iOS is now completely open. You can write any kind of app. So he did a, a 180. He went from closed to open in one year. Many companies cannot do that. They think that they will look stupid that they will look like they made a mistake, that they would look cowardly. And they'd rather stick to a mistake rather than change their mind, admit a mistake, and move on. If you want to be a revolutionary and an innovator, you have to be able to change your mind. Number eight. Number eight is all the marketing you need to understand. Okay? So, there's two axes. Degree of differentiation and value. If you are here, it means that you have something that is valuable, but it is not unique. If you are Michael Dell, you have the same Windows operating system on the same hardware. You can make a lot of money there, but it is always about price. If you are here, only you make something, but it is of no value. In that corner, you are just stupid. In the bottom left corner, you are stupid and it's crowded. I like to use the example of Pets.com during the dot-com days. So Pets.com, this was a way to buy dog food online. The reason why it wasn't that valuable was you could eliminate the pet food retailer and discount dog food, but then you had to add back shipping and handling, right? So you don't go to the retail store, you save the retail margin, but then the dead cow in the can is still in the factory. You need to get it to your house. So then you had to ship it, and shipping and handling was roughly the same amount as the discount. And also, you had to be at home when UPS tried to drop off the dead cow in the can. So it was less convenient, just as expensive. Now, why were there so many forms of pets.com? It's because they fell for this pitch. The 300 million Americans, one in four owns a dog, 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day, and dogs eat 365 days a year. This is not a B2B business. This is a B2C business. Dogs eat every day. It's actually B2D. Dogs eat <laughs> every day. 
So you take, conservatively speaking, 150 million cans of dog food per day. You multiply that by a mere 1%. How hard could it be with my rock star co-founder to get 1% of this market? That's 1.5 million cans of dog food per day times 365. We're talking 5, 6, 700 million cans of dog food every year. How hard could that be? So that's why we funded Pets.com, MyPets.com, LastInThePets.com, DiscountPets.com. There are 10 ways to buy dead cows in cans online. The corner you want to be in, and all of marketing and innovation boils down to this, is this corner. In that corner, you are unique and valuable. When the iPod first came out, it was unique and valuable. It had a user interface that a mere mortal could operate, the click wheel. You could buy songs from the six most popular publishers. You could do that legally and inexpensively. It was a unique and valuable thing, the iPod, when it first came out. That's why iPod succeeded. So all of marketing boils down to creating and making people believe that you have something that is unique and valuable. Number nine. Number nine is stolen from Chairman Mao, although I fail to see how we ever really use this. Let a hundred flowers. It means that when you have an innovation, you take your best shot in positioning and branding. How should people use it? Who should use it? Et cetera, et cetera. And then you ship, and then reality strikes. And you may find a very interesting thing, that people that you did not anticipate as your customers are using it in unanticipated ways. And many companies freak out when this happens. Oh my God, people are buying our products in large quantities and they're using it in ways we did not anticipate. Let me give you a piece of advice. If this ever happens to you, take the money. <laughs> Do not be proud, take the money. Declare victory. We had Macintosh going out there for spreadsheet database and we're a processor, we were zero for three. What saved us was desktop publishing. Desktop publishing was a gift from God to Apple. It saved Apple. No desktop publishing, no Apple today. And I'll tell you that we had almost nothing to do with the creation of the desktop publishing market. And it was one company, Aldis, and another company, Adobe, with Postscript. Postscript and PageMaker created desktop publishing. We got along for the ride. We declared victory. We were seeing that Large companies were rejecting Macintosh for spreadsheet database and were processors, but many companies, big and small, love Macintosh for desktop publishing. So guess what? We said Macintosh is for desktop publishing. Hallelujah, we hit the bullseye. <laughs> Let a hundred flowers blossom. Don't be proud. Number 10, stolen from the Black Panthers who said burn, baby, burn. I think what innovators in business do is churn, baby, churn. This is a big realization of mine. I thought that, you know, innovation is an event. January 24th, 1984, you ship Macintosh. That's it. That's the hard part. All we have to do is make them in quantity now. Not at all true. Not at all true. So you have to really understand that innovation is a process. It's not an event. The day you ship is when the real work truly does begin because reality will strike and customers are going to start telling you how to fix it and that's when work really begins. Churn, baby, churn. 1.0 must become 1.01, 1.02, 1.1, 1.2, 1.5, 1.7, 1.9, 1 and 2.0. It could take you 20 or 30 years to go from Mac 128K to iMac Pro. Number 11, as a bonus for you, if you want to be a successful innovator, you need to learn how to pitch. You are going to have to pitch. Pitch for money, pitch for approval, pitch for partnerships, pitch for sales, pitch to recruit. So I'm going to give you how to pitch. Number one, always customize your introduction. God's greatest gift to customizing your introduction is LinkedIn. Because on LinkedIn, you can find out where people worked who you know in common, what school they went to. LinkedIn is God's gift to a great presentation. You are stupid if you go into a meeting and you haven't looked up everybody on LinkedIn. It enables you to customize your introduction. You are looking for points of commonality, that you both lived in Western Australia, that you both worked for Apple, that you both 
taught Photoshop, whatever it is, look for commonality. Second thing is follow what I call the 10-20-30 rule. The 10-20-30 rule is that you should have 10 slides in your presentation. Every stinking one of you should have 10 slides. A lot of people, when they hear this, they think, oh, guy, you know, yes, the great unwashed masses, the hoi polloi, they should have 10 slides. But I have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, enterprise class, scalable way to sell dog food online. I need 50 slides. You need 10 slides. <laughs> now, German audience that you are, you're very quantitatively and engineering and very exact kind of people. You're probably standing there thinking, so guy, you're telling me to use 10 slides, but you're on number 41 right now. <laughs> What's up with that, right? Let me explain. You are not me. <laughs> you should be able to give these 10 slides in 20 minutes. 20 minutes, that's about the best kind of time. You want lots of time for discussion. And meetings always start late. If you're using a Windows laptop, you may need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. <laughs> Try to give your 10 slides in 20 minutes. And finally, the smallest font should be 30 points. A very good rule of thumb is figure out who the oldest person is in the audience, divide his or her age by two. So if you're pitching a 60-year-old VCs, 30-point font. 50-year-old VCs, 25-point font. 16-year-old VC, God bless you, use an 8-point font. <laughs> and one more piece of advice to you. Make your background black. Make your background black. Black shows gravitas, it shows seriousness. It shows that you truly know how to make a presentation. If you use white background with black text, it shows you are an amateur, that you booted PowerPoint and you immediately started typing. Black shows that you went to the master slide page and you picked a black background and you picked this nice, thick, easy to read sans serif font, right? It shows a degree of professionalism. When you use a black background, one of the great benefits is that you cannot tell where my slide ends and the outline of the screen begins. Think about this. Have you ever gone to a movie and seen the credits where credits were black text, white screen? Never, never. Black is the new black. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a funny story about black being the new black in background. So one day, I meet with this entrepreneur about 11 in the morning. He says, you know, guy, I pitched my company once. I have another pitch at 2 o'clock. And he was a black entrepreneur from Georgia. And he says, well, I got three hours. I don't have that much to do. you have any quick tips on how I can make my presentation better? And I said to him, is your background black? And he said, yeah, I told you. I'm from a multicultural family from Georgia. <laughs> I said, no, I can see that you're black. I want to know if your PowerPoint background is black. So make your background black. Black is the new black. This is my last slide, number 44. <laughs> this I learned from Steve Jobs also. You know, when it comes to tech, when it comes to entrepreneurship, many people have this attitude, well, if I see it, I'll believe it. And I'll tell you the, work, the way it works and what we're trying to do is you need to believe to see. You need, be to, you need to believe in Macintosh. You need to risk your company and write Macintosh software. You need to write iOS apps. If you believe and you write Mac apps, if you believe and write iOS apps, then you will actually see Macintosh and you will see iOS devices actually become of value. So the way it works in tech, we had to get people to believe in Canva before they really saw Canva. So this is the way it works in tech innovation. You need to get people to believe in order to see, as opposed to see in order to believe. Some things need to be believed to be seen. And that, courtesy of Mercedes-Benz and Lab 1886, is the art of innovation. Thank you. Thank you. So, what is... Is there another? I'm sure. Is there another um, speaker after me? No, it no, isn't. no. Oh, so, so we, we can. So we have time for questions okay. now. <laughs> okay. I'm sure so there are a lot of questions. Please raise your hands, and yes. then we will come to I'm you. Yes. Coming. First one here. 
Thank you. Uh, this is both a follow-up to the Q&A before and to your last slide. <laughs> so you talked about Theranos, uh, and there was a lot of people that believed it, but in the end they couldn't see it. How do you shield yourself and then the larger world from things like this happening? That is a very good question. Um, well, I guess at some point, you should see the technology work at all, right? And I think Theranos never really worked. Um, this is why you should never do Q&A, because shit, that just contradicted everything I said. Um, <laughs> it's a good point. I mean, yes, the Terranoses of the world do exist. Uh, but I would say that you know, to be an entrepreneur, you have to believe. I mean, I, I, I hope that at the beginning of that company, those people truly did believe that they had the science and the engineering to make it true. Maybe at the end, it was all bullshit. But I can see at the beginning where they had to believe it to make it true. Um, the question is, do you draw the line? I'm, I'm not telling you to lie. I'm telling you, you have to believe. There is a difference. What else? First of all, thank you for your presentation. Yes. Um, my question is whether you think that we will all still be driving in our 10 square meter large individual aluminum boxes around in a couple of years. And if not so, can Germany, by your definition, do the, I guess, the transformation from being a leader in the automobile space to a leader in the mobility space? Um, I absolutely, well, in two years? Not in two years. Two years is too fast. I didn't say two years. Right? Oh, we, we, Whenever Yes, you did. Did he not say two years? Yeah. Yeah. Nice try. Um, uh, I don't think it's going to be two years. But, and I'm not telling you based on any secrets I know about Mercedes. But I think we're going to look back and say, what were we thinking all buying cars that were burning fossil fuels? And, you know, like right now, when I was in high school, chemistry class, we, we used to have asbestos pads and asbestos gloves, right? To, to pick up the hot beaker and all that. So like now, if somebody said there's asbestos, they, you know, they call in the government and everybody comes in like suits, right? I mean, not, not, not coat and tie suits. I mean, yeah. Uh, so I, I cannot wait for the world where cars are all electric and they're autonomous and you don't necessarily have to own them. And so they are, I don't know if, you know, we just read your mind or whatever, but somehow, let's take the worst case, you have a, an app and you say, call this car, and a car comes to you and it's driverless and you get in and it takes you and you get out and you don't care about parking, you don't own it, your house no longer has a garage, there's no longer parking lots in, in city downtowns. I can't wait for that day. I think that'll be a great day. Yeah? We have another question here. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, uh, uh, coming back to your um, um, saying that you, uh, companies need to jump to the next curve. Yes. Um, Lab 1886 is a kind of um, try to jump to the next curve yes. uh, for Mercedes-Benz. But the lab is only... 18, 80 to 100 people um, around the world. Yes. Mercedes has way over 100,000 employees. Yes. How do they make the jump? What has Dieter to tell them? What has Dieter to um, do to the company to jump? Sure. So uh, I, I would say that Lab 1886 represents a way to tap the outside expertise and in innovation and revolutionary thinking that may not necessarily be inside. And there are also, I think, Lab 1886, correct me if I'm wrong, Lab 1886 people, but there may be engineers inside of Mercedes who are in the mainstream, but they have an idea outside. So if there was a Kodak 1886, maybe that digital photographer would have gone for, a, I mean, that maybe that engineer who invented the digital camera would go, could have gone to Kodak 1886 and created the business that would eventually put the film business out of business. So I think that is the theory. Uh, I think, you know, one of the real world realities is that in a company as large as Daimler that's publicly traded, you know, you do have to show financial results. And there are very few technologies 
that are new curves that you can profit from in 90 days. So I think 1886 is a very good hedge to get both the some of the engineers inside and also the t technical expertise outside. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of people mainstream in Mercedes working on electric helicopters, for example. And yet that could be a crucial part of the mass transportation system in the future. So it makes good sense to me. I don't... Uh, I think the most important lesson, though, is that everybody inside of Mercedes should realize that we don't want Mercedes to be a Kodak. And uh, Mercedes started in 1926, so, you know, the first hundred years are the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> can you, do you have the experience, not only the one you gave by Steve Jobs, but uh, can, can you share it where you yourself made a real big mistake in, in ass uh, an assumption about the technology and... Oh. Uh, do you, do you want like false that? positives or false negatives? I got both. <laughs> um, so, well, you heard that I left Apple twice and I turned Steve Jobs down for a third, right? So that's probably 200 million right there. Um, I was also, believe it or not, called by the venture capitalist who funded Yahoo. This is just when Yahoo was started. And he asked me if I wanted to interview for the CEO position of Yahoo. And I was living in San Francisco, and I had one child. My wife was in beta with our second child. And I told him that it was too far to drive to work at Yahoo. And I didn't see how Yahoo could be a business. Because at the time, Yahoo was a collection, a directory of two people's favorite websites. Right? This was before Yahoo Mail, Yahoo Auctions, Yahoo Store, Yahoo Flickr, you know, all that stuff. So I turned down the opportunity to be at least interviewed for the first CEO of Yahoo. So that probably costs two billion. You know, and two billion here, two billion there. It adds up to real money <laughs> after a while. So right there is two and a quarter billion. Um, there are bets that I made as a venture capitalist that never came through. Uh, I, I will tell you, venture capital is a very difficult game um, because at the time you have to make a decision, it's not at all clear about the size of the market, the technology, or the quality of the people. And, you know, when, when you ask a venture capitalist, well, Why did you invest in Google? Venture capitalists will say, I knew Larry and Sergey were a world-class team, and I knew people, you know, that there was so much information out there, but people needed a way to find that information, and people were finding that information. By finding the information, they would indicate their interests. So if somebody searched for a surfboard, hmm, guess what? They're interested in buying a surfboard. Shove a surfboard ad at them. So I knew Google would be successful. So, well, why'd you invest in YouTube? Well, I knew that cameras are going to be better and better and phones are going to shoot video. Networks would be faster, so people would be shooting video and uploading them. And then you say, well, why'd you invest in pets.com? And the venture capitalists will say, I told my dumbass partners not to do that deal. And so that's how it works. And at the point you need to squeeze the trigger... I can give you five reasons why every one of those companies should have never succeeded, right? So, you know, take YouTube. So, um, we need unlimited bandwidth, unlimited server space for people to upload illegal video that they've ripped off. But what's going to make us tip is when people start dropping Mentos into Diet Cokes. <laughs> Would you like to invest in YouTube? <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> How about Twitter? Oh, yeah, so we're going to enable people to write 140-character text messages like the line at Starbucks is long. My cat rolled over. You would immediately say, well, who cares if your cat rolled over? Who cares if the line in Berlin is long if you're in Cupertino? Haven't you ever heard of text messages? Have you heard of IRC? Have you heard of chat? Why would you invest in Twitter? How about eBay? So I'm going to enable people to buy and sell used HP printers. 
the first question you would have is, well, if you're buying the printer and you're in Atlanta and the printer's in Palo Alto, how do you know the printer's going to work? And if you're selling the printer and your buyer's in Atlanta and you're in Palo Alto, how do you know that he's not going to claim that he never got the box and that, you know, Visa is going to take back the money because, you know, a claim was filed. So how do you know you'll get paid? Besides that, there's no problem with eBay, you know. And lo and behold, you know, today people buy like $500,000 Ferraris on eBay without seeing them. That just boggles my mind, right? And so I think at the point that any of these companies are starting, you just don't know. I could almost make the case you should invest in the most dumbass idea you hear. Because <laughs> that seems to be a not bad investment thesis. Um, but then you got to believe. Uh, this doesn't mean that everything you believe in will come true. <laughs> but if you don't believe in anything, it probably won't come true. So, what else? Who's got the mic is Here. the question. Oh, oh, you have the mic. Yeah. Uh, talking about believing, there was a guy in your land, Henry Ford. He believed that the uh, cars could be built out of hemp. That was 1930s. Out of what? Out of hemp. Hemp? Hemp. As in marijuana? Yes. Hemp? Yeah. Now Porsche released a sports car, which is uh, built, like the, the body is built out of hemp. And uh, Henry, no. yes, it's true. Seriously? You're running for the wrong company, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, you are just uh, talking about the fossil fuels and about the next curve, which I really like. Do you think that hemp cam coming from California could be the next curve? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I must say that I, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you that I wake up in the morning thinking if only I could get a hemp AMG GT. Um, that's not at the top of my list. But what? The car looks pretty dope. Why, it should look dope. It's made out of hemp. <laughs> um, well, what part is made out of hemp? The whole body is made out of hemp, and it has, it's it got 420 PS, and it's a sports car uh, which hasn't been released to normal streets. It's like the newest shit on the market. <laughs> and, and Henry Ford didn't only build a hemp car. He, the car was running on hemp fuel. So if you ask me, hemp could be a new curve. Hemp is I the new black? <laughs> you said it. God bless you, man. Go buy a hemp Porsche. Go for it. I don't know. I'm here, Guy. Oh. Hi. Hi. It's a more serious question, so. <laughs> he was serious. <laughs> yeah, I was joking. <laughs> um, the nonprofit sector is still raising money in a very traditional way. Uh huh. Um, and especially perhaps on technology. What would be your advice or your one-minute pitch to push them innovate in the way they raise money? Well, d uh, do you believe that um, you know GoFundMe and Kickstarter and all those kind of things are effective for not-for-profits? Because I do, and I think that is a completely new way, right? And um, I just the concept of always trying to find somebody rich or some philanthropist or some foundation to fund you is equal to an entrepreneur always believing they have to go suck up to Sand Hill Venture Capitalists. Same kind of, same algorithm. And yet, you know, one of the differences that I didn't think of about how entrepreneurship is different is now because of Kickstarter. So there are different ways to raise money that do not involve venture capital, which I think is a positive because venture capital is not for everybody. In fact, it's for very few companies. So I love the crowdfunding of things. Um, it's not dilutive. It also is a much more true test of is there demand for your product because you're getting people to really separate from their money as opposed to venture capitalists who are betting somebody else's money. Um, and I think it's <sighs> probably a more healthy way to raise money. 
The venture capital game, for those of you who are interested, is a very limited game. I mean, you know, venture capitalist perspective is they want to create the next Google or Apple or Cisco or Yahoo or Canva. Um, it's a very specialized game. And so uh, don't confuse fundability with viability. You can have a company that's completely viable, but not a venture capital fundable company. You could also have a fundable company that's not viable, e.g. Theranos. So um, don't confuse the things, fundability and, and viability. Hi, Guy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions, actually. Yeah. And the first one is about public speaking. Yeah. What do you think made you a good public speaker? Or were you always <laughs> a good public speaker? Uh, uh, for me, public speaking, first of all, I was very intimidated about speaking in public in like 1987 or so, probably before you were born. Um, and it was because I worked in the Macintosh division. So you work for Macintosh division, and you know there's Steve Jobs making presentations. You think, how the hell am I ever going to measure up to that, right? So that was number one. Uh, so what worked for me is sheer quantity, just the sheer just repetition. So I speak 75 times a year. 75 times a year since, I don't know, call it 2000. So let's say 20 years times 75, you know, like I've given speeches 2000 times. Um, that's what it's taken. But now I can, I can do anything on, I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't, that's not, I'm not trying to brag. I'm, saying I'm very comfortable speaking. Um, so it's the sheer quantity of it, okay? Yeah, and my, and my background is black. <laughs> 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 what? What else? Yeah. Uh, my second question is: What makes a quality uh, venture capitalist? What you think is the one quality about a successful venture capitalist? Luck. <laughs> Luck. Yeah. Better to be lucky than smart. Hi, Guy. Um, I'm Paulina Quinn. Thank you for coming, and it's been a great talk. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, because you've spoken a lot about investing and also about the importance of people, how do you find um, those great people, and what are the characteristics that you look for and also that you try to yeah. build in yourself? This, is, this, again, is one of those things that, you know, after the fact, you can say, I always knew that they would be great entrepreneurs, but you know, conceptually, a venture capitalist makes 20 bets and two or three are successful. The other 17 are not successful. So you'd have to ask yourself, so did you know the other 17 founders were lousy? And you'd have to say that, well, at the time you wrote the check, you obviously didn't think that, right? Because you would not have written the check. So I don't know. Um, I think that... You know, if, if you're ever in the game to pick entrepreneurs to fund, you should not necessarily limit yourself to people you like. I could make the case that the ideal entrepreneur lacks social skills, <laughs> touch of OCD, touch of ADHD, Maybe even on the Asperger's uh, scale, because there are lots of successful tech entrepreneurs that you, let's just say you would not want to be buddies with. <laughs> so you might want to look for the social misfits, not the you know the quarterback and the homecoming queen. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say that those are people that, you know, you would say, oh, they're great guys, let's go have a beer. Um, so, and, and then, oh, and the other quality I already mentioned is that they're building something that they want to use. I think more generally, not just entrepreneurs, but for when you build teams. Oh, when, when you, you build teams. People, ah, yeah, ah, I you see. you actually have to spend time with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, when you build teams, I would say that my advice is, uh, you try to diversify, that not everybody should be male, white, tall, if 
from the Ivy League school. You should have diversity. And also, you should look for people who complement your skills. So fundamentally, in a startup, there are only two functions. Somebody has to make it, and somebody has to sell it. <laughs> and if you have only people who can make it, there's nobody to sell it, and you'll fail. And if you have people who only can sell it, what will they sell? What will, they'll, what will they sell? Because there's nobody to make it. So you want people to complement your skills. Uh, I think also, as you look around the room, it should be a source of pride if you can say, you know, this person is better than me in sales, this per is better than me in finance, in marketing, in operations, in engineering, in testing. And you should look at it and say, man, I might be the least competent person in the room and I'm CEO. That is a good position to be in. On the other hand, if you're the CEO and you say, I'm smarter than her in marketing, him in finance, him in operations, him in HR, him in, you know, operation, whatever, I think you're a loser. There's a saying that A players hire A plus players, B players hire C players. So you should hire better than yourself. You should, you should be a source of pride. And my God, all the people in here make me look dumb. That is a really good position. Then you could make the case if you can look around the room and say, all these people here are smarter than me, you are a smart person. <laughs> you ultimately may be the smartest person because you realize your limitations. Okay, what time is it? <laughs> really? Really? Okay. Hello, hello. Um, Guy, uh, one short question. What do you think about innovating in, in networks and in ecosystems? Because you, you were talking just now about, about the team, mm -hmm. but if you, if you scale this up into ecosystems like Silicon Valley, what is your personal opinion about this? What are the, the challenges, barriers? What are the, well, the greatest um, opportunities there? First of all, I don't think true innovators look at themselves as a part of an ecosystem. Right, so true innovators just says, "I want to make the best freaking product or service." They're not saying, oh, "What can I do for the ecosystem?" Only governments think like that. So an entrepreneur should just make the best damn product he or she can, and not worry about the ecosystem. Um, what else? What I mean? Is, is so, which if you need some certain skills or something? Yeah. Should should be easier from the law of big scale uh, scales that you that you find these experts in an ecosystem easier than you find it when you're sitting alone in your ivory tower and thinking about the freaking yeah. best product. Yeah. Um, what, yes. Sorry. But is there a question? No, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think it's the law of big numbers, and you have to like you know you have to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, but then find frogs that compliment you, basically. I don't mean French people. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I think that's what it takes. And I just ask you to uh, suspend, you know, you're, you're not looking for a spouse, <laughs> okay? Uh, so you, 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 you might not pick people that you want to hang around with and all that. But um, if you take an extreme, you know, a great tester may not be the person you want to hang around with. It's okay. Um, you need all kinds of different skills. Okay? So, hi, Guy. Here's a ride from you? Düsseldorf. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. Um, what, in fact, does uh, Daimler do not to become a next Kodak? Uh, I see SUVs with uh, electric engines, of yeah. course. But I see awful designs on sedans, which are preferred from the guys around the main station, from the clan guys. I see uh, uh, the scandals of uh, diesel and uh, everything. Where's the real revolution? Where's the real mobility change, uh, the, the turn? Well... Listen, I'm a brand ambassador. I'm not Dieter Zetcher. Um, I, I think for Mercedes, the key is the electrification. That the EQC uh, is a key part of the company these days. The world is going electric. And I can't wait for an electric car. And I just, 
Yeah, I. But it's not only electrification; it doesn't make the mobility change. Well, but you know, if you, if you look at the if you look at the totality of what Mercedes is doing with car to go and my taxi and all you know helicopter and all that stuff there's a lot of bets going on here this is a uh, mercedes is a very uh, i'm obviously i'm kind of inside mercedes but it's a very impressive company um and you know it's not i i, I come from the computer business and i know how hard the computer business is to make one of these i am just floored by how hard it is to make a car because if one of these crashes you reboot if one of our car fails you die and and this basically stays on a desk and it's you know maybe i might drop it but it's not going to snow and rain and sleet driven by stupid people and you know i mean it's good there's a car has so many more stresses on it and I, I just marvel at how <laughs> how cars can last so long and be so good. I mean, as as uh, what's that guy? <sighs> he used to have the show, and then they went to Amazon. Um, Jeremy Clarkson, yeah, he had a statement I thought was very good, which is uh, recently he said that there really aren't any lousy cars anymore. I mean, there it used to be that, you know, there were some builds of car. Well, I don't know, Alfa Romeo, but there used to be some builds of cars that, you know, you just wouldn't buy. It was just, it just wouldn't work. But, I mean, think about that. Almost every car you buy today is really rock solid. I just, I love cars. And <laughs> I don't like hemp, though, but I love cars. <laughs> Ten, years. Ten years. What are you smoking? Um <laughs> Okay, so I think that's the end of my wisdom. We have last two. Oh, yeah, last, last two questions. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, hi, Alex from Bielefeld. Um, Mercedes-Benz is in a position to uh, define a new curve, but what would you be your advice to SMBs, small companies, family-owned companies that are working for the automobile uh, industry that are great in? Like the, the last 50 or 60 years uh, engineering tiny pieces for the engine that makes it go 2% better or yeah. that are making better knobs for the cockpit. <laughs> and then Tesla comes and says, we don't need any knobs, we just put a display there. So what would be your advice for those companies to uh, uh, in, in the art of innovation? Well... I mean, it seems to me conceptually, well, okay, I don't know that much about how the car business works, but I know it's not as simple as, well, I show up, I show you a new transmission, and you put it in next year's model, right? I mean, it takes a few years for this to happen, right? But I, I would hope that people at, you know, ZF are making transmissions, that 10-speed transmissions, or, you know, whatever. maybe you don't need a transmission when you have an electric motor. But I, I would think that there's got to be innovation in the entire vendor chain, um, that, I mean, in a sense, isn't that why there is a Lab 1886 so that, you know, there can be innovation and people inside or outside of Mercedes can come up with new technologies for the car that could not be made inside right now, a large 200,000 person organization, I would think. Um, again, you know, I have to temper this. So, you know, I'm a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador. It's not like I have an office in Stuttgart and I'm making policy decisions, okay? Fundamentally, I'm just like getting paid to drive a Mercedes. Um, I have an S-Class with surf racks on it. If you ever see, if you ever see an S63 with surf racks on it in Santa Cruz, that's me. Yeah, I have the fastest surf car in America. So. Okay, one last question. The last question is here. Uh, thanks for making us jealous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is about your uh, recommendation number seven, where you said you have to be able to change your mind like yeah. 180 around. Um, what other characteristics do you have to bring to not get dropped by your stakeholders or whatever, if you change, want to change your mind? Well, if you're Steve Jobs, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, but not everybody's a Steve Jobs. Um, I, I think you need to, I don't think there should be any surprises that if you're going to make, you know, 180 degree change like that. You should definitely go to your stakeholders and say, this is why. And then I, I think you, uh, 
you need to cite historical examples and say, well, listen, if we don't change, we're going to be like Kodak. Well, what stakeholders are going to say, oh, yeah, let's be like Kodak. Keep on going down that path. Um, I think you need to use historical examples like that. How about looking at politicians, for example? How about politicians? Which politician? Yeah. I mean, any. Like, if you look at, like, um, I don't know, like, for energy or for whatever, like, um, politicians in this those areas, they... They are simply not able to change their mind, otherwise they won't get elected twice. Well, you're assuming politicians have minds, but <laughs> yes. Um, I really, I don't want to discuss politics, but as you can imagine, I am disgusted. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't understand what's going on in America. I apologize to all of you right now in advance for on behalf of America. Um, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>